that quicker oh, process. Okay. So, so that would make him an expert at playing a mandolin, at least as far as probably no. anyone else in this room. Oh, no. But I'll tell you what he is an expert in, I just have to mention, he's an expert dad with two beautiful little boys, A.P. and Riley, yes. a little over two years old, and the, just, they're just a delight to watch grow up with all the photos he puts on Facebook. So get him on Facebook, you can follow A.P. and Riley's adventures. <laughs> so Adam is going to uh, demonstrate these beautiful Northfield mandolins and talk about mandolin playing, and please welcome to the Cooper's Glen stage, Adam Steffi. Special big thanks to the Great Lakes uh, Acoustic Music Association for allowing the boxcars and myself uh, to be here, and I really appreciate y'all for uh, for coming by this afternoon and sitting in with me on this mandolin workshop, uh, and especially the folks at Northfield for making this available and to everyone that might be watching. Uh, welcome, and uh, I'll be fielding questions and things. And uh, first, let me let me say uh, this is my my main mandolin here. Folks always want to know what you're playing and what the setup is and strings and uh, all that. So I'll go ahead and get that out of the way right up front. Uh, this is a mandolin that I've had for, I guess, a little over a year now. And I've played it primarily out and about and uh, doing recordings and things. This is the one, this has been my main axe. And um, it's a, it's what they call a big mun uh, model. It's uh, patterned along the lines of what you would see a standard F5 uh, style mandolin. But it has some dimensional differences to it, like the width from outside to outside is a little bit bigger, and I think it's a little wider in spots, and the way that it's graduated may be a little bit different due to the size, but uh, you can go on their website, certainly, and check out all the, they have a, a great diagram on there of what like a standard F5 dimensionally is, and then say in blue color, and then in red, it has what the Big Mun model is. So this one's made out of, uh, this one has a standard red spruce top with the uh, with the maple, the sugar maple back, neck and sides. And um, we're currently, you know, I'm, I'm older I get, seems like I want a wider neck. Uh, and so I've got, I've, got a, I've got a Collings A model that has a wide neck on it. It's got the one and three sixteenths. And uh, so I'm thinking, we're gonna, looking into, I'm, I'm sort of a research and development guy. I, <laughs> I, I, I get, get these mandolins and kind of, test them out and try them out and try different things out. So uh, this, this mandolin is just a terrific instrument and uh, anybody that's here is welcome to play it. And I have D'Addario strings on here. I've been using D'Addario strings for, for ages now, since I was, before I got with Allison Krauss back in the early 90s, <clears throat> I was using the D'Addario strings. These here are actually a lighter gauge. They're like, a, it's the, the number is the J73s and they're actually a, a light string, like a 10, 14, 24, I believe it is, and a 38 from, uh, from top to bottom. So these are a little bit lighter than what I've used. I've gone heavier and I go lighter. I'm, I'm always tinkering with, uh, with any mandolin that I'm playing and different setups and uh, certainly going from, you'll find a lot of times in the winter time your instrument might start acting a little 
freaky on you. It might play differently because uh, when you start getting that forced heat in a room or you know things like that, it's very important to keep them humidified. And so I used to be really bad about not doing that. And now I run humidifiers throughout the house, and it makes a big difference because I, I know from traveling around the mandolin. I'm from the southeast, obviously, by the way I talk, if you didn't catch that, but I'm, I'm from Tennessee, and so it's really humid there, usually in the summertime, hot, humid, you know, you walk, I, I go out on the road sometimes, we'll be playing in, I remember last year we played in, um, uh, I think, Moses Lake, Washington, which is uh, west of Spokane, uh, about an hour, hour and a half, something like that, and I, I knew it felt really dry, you know, to my sinuses and things, but I looked on on the Weather Channel app on my phone and it said there was 7% humidity. And so the mandolin had gone from 85, 90% humidity and really hot to, to there. And so it played completely different. The action feels different. Everything sort of changes. And uh, so I try not to, to adjust it a lot. You may, you may have to find that you, you may need to do some minor adjustments on your, on your mandolin, you know, in the, to go from the winter to the summer. But, uh, but I, I try not to change it a whole lot. Uh, mainly when I say I'm tinkering with it, I'm just using different gauges of strings. Certain mandolins like certain gauges, it seems like some of them speak better with, with heavier gauge. And, and some seem to, to like a, a medium gauge, say. But I'm always using either the J73s, 74s, or the, uh, I like the EXP 75s as well. And that's actually a little bit sort of a medium heavy gauge. That's like an 11 and a half, 16, 26, and 41, I believe, of those. But Diodario's, uh, I love those strings. I try, I've tried all kinds of different ones, you know, all the different makes and models. And uh, I love Elixirs as well. But uh, I always seem to end up playing Diodario's 99% of the time. So the, that's the story on this mandolin. Nothing, this is, I didn't have them do anything special with this one. This is one that, uh, Adrian uh, at Northfield had with him. Uh, we met up down at the festival in Indiana, and uh, he had this mandolin, and I got to play it on it. I was I was playing a, a standard F5 that they had. That that was the first Northfield that I got a hold of, and uh, this this one was one of the first big bond models I guess that I played, and so I fell in love with the tone. It has a, a bigger, rounder, richer sound, and I'll play some of these different ones here in a minute and let you hear the difference, but this one, this is the one I've, I've been playing. As I said, I've sort of beat it up a little bit, but not as bad as Don Julian. <laughs> if you know Don Julian, bless his heart, he's probably, if he's watching this, now he can, he's wore his mantle now, but, uh, but now this one, I've, I've beat it up pretty good, but, uh, but it's a great instrument. Uh, any questions about setup or anything, if you're a mandolin player and have any questions about strings or picks or Yes, sir. When you change your, your, your gauges from light and heavy, do you change the height of the action at all? Or? Sometimes you have to, yeah. I have found like using these, these are almost a little too soft right now for the winter time because it seems like the action wants to drop down and then in the summer it seems like it'll raise back up and, and settle in. So these are actually a little too light. I've been using them for about the past month or so. And um, I change strings generally, uh, I try to change I used to change before every show, but um, I, then you're doing a lot of tuning, you know, and I don't like the sound of strings that are brand new. They're almost too bright and harsh. So um, I, that's one thing that I love about the EXP strings is that they, they settle in seems to quicker than just the regular, you know, uncoated phosphor strings. But what I, what I use, and I brought this up here specifically for this, um, I've, I've told a lot of people about this and it may be, I may end up like getting some kind of, I may have like a third arm growing out of my forehead here at some point, but um, I take a rag, I just take, this is just a polishing cloth, you know, and I take WD-40 and I just hold it up like by a crease like that and I spray WD-40 down this crease and then I spray it on the other side. Not a, not a big amount where it's just like dripping, but just enough and this one I've had for a while and you can see where that line is, and I, I usually just wipe the strings off with that. And so, uh, and it tastes good on a sandwich like you know, <laughs> It's not really bad, but I've, I had, I've been doing it for a while, and, and someone pointed out that on the, there's a website somewhere that says like, 
a hundred uses for WD-40. And like number six was clean your guitar strings. You know, and I, but my thing was going to, when we're playing on the road and going to all these various climates, I'm, a lot of the way I play, I'll do these long slides. I'll do a... And try to get as much sustain uh, I've never liked my tremolo. My tremolo, I, I, I can't do the the real fast tremolo very well, so I'll do a as opposed to like that. So I'll, I'll kind of sort of a halftime thing. But when I'm when I'm sliding around and I go to these various climates, if it's really really dry and I go to make one of those big slides, it's almost like it'll it'll it's just you're dragging. You know, because that's the, the sensation that there is, is it's just when, the, when that fingerboard gets dry and everything feels really dry, I go to slide and I'll undershoot the runway and crash, you know, a lot. So uh, I found using that, that it makes the strings last longer. And uh, I, I just can keep some on my fingers and it gives me that, like a brand new string effect, but it doesn't make the string really bright sounding, you know. But it keeps, when I'm changing strings, I'll, I'll wipe the fingerboard down with it, you know, and all. And so uh, the guys with Northfield are probably going, man, that's going to make the fingerboard come off. But, uh, <laughs> but I've, I've never, I've, I've, it, it's not causing any problems, you know, at all. So outside of, I wet my pants every time I go by a cell tower now. I think that might have something to do. Uh, but, but anyway, the, this, that's, that's when you see me, like I, sometimes I'll take it out on stage with me. The thing is, when we're playing outside in the summertime, uh, if it's really hot and you're sweating and stuff like that, a lot of times you'll feel phosphor bronze strings. You know, they kind of get real gritty and kind of, and you get that that kind of real rough sound. And so I try to keep everything as smooth. When I'm playing, all I want to have, I want to have the separation of the notes, and I want to have each note have its value, and try to play as clean as possible. And where the upstroke and the downstroke, uh, you you can't designate between them. It's just you know. I, that's my goal anyway. Do I pull it off every time? Absolutely not. But, um, you know, the idea is just to play the individual. If I'm playing a, I want to have each note, da, 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 you know. And so if my strings are kind of crusty and getting that, you know, kind of thing going on, um, I, it just helps. It's just a little uh, trick of the trade, lack of a better metaphor, but that's probably what it is, you know, just something that, that, that works for me. Uh, I've tried the different things like fast fret and, yeah. and things like that. And it, it, for, my, for my chemical makeup, I guess it makes, it works for just a minute and then it kind of starts getting a little bit. So for some folks it works great. And, and, uh, but different people have different, I have a friend of mine back home that, and every, I guess it's just your, whatever is in your system but you probably know people who can pick up an instrument with brand new strings on it and that they turn the color of this, this mic windscreen, you know, in about 10 seconds. There's a friend of mine back home that plays mandolin and um, he, he at least is kind enough, if, you know, I'm always like, hey man, play one on this, you know, he's a great picker. And he's like, man, you're not, are you done? Are you going to change these strings? Because <laughs> he knows, you know, when he picks it up. And he can play, like I, I saw him changing strings before a show one day at a festival and he got finished and came off stage and I mean, his strings looked like, you know, something had gotten killed on his fingerboard, you know. <laughs> there was black up here and green over here and you know, there's like potatoes growing in between the frets and things. But, but great player and he can make it work. So, you know, WD-40 might not work for him at all, but um, and if anybody from WD-40 is here, <laughs> We could use a bus. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play another one of these instruments here. Any other questions? Any, 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 if anybody's got questions, just holler out. Now, let's see. Hmm. Yeah. Now, this is one. Uh, this is a standard. I think this is one of the standard ones. Is mm -hmm. that right? Now, this is, you probably won't be able to tell from a distance. But this is a standard size, and this is the what they call the big mun size. So just looking at it from a distance, you can't. It's not that big of a difference. Uh, the only way, the only way I can really tell is when I go to put it in my case. It's this one's just a little tighter fit, you know. But it it does make a difference in the sound. 
this this man on here's a brand new one that uh, that I just got a while ago. It's it's got a one piece back on it, and uh, it's a it's a great man on it. And this I believe has a is this a lacquer finish on this one? No, that's a varnish. This is a varnish as well. So, but it's it, this is more of the standard. Uh, this is a terrific man. Now you'll find I have found different different types of wood give you a different kind of effect, and and I'm I'm as mandolin addicted as anybody. I like playing all different kinds of mandolins and all different you know uh, A models, and you know in in the bluegrass world a lot of people. What are you doing playing A model, man? You gotta get that F five out, you know. And and I just I love all different kinds of mandolins, you know. I'm just I, I love the instrument, and each one has a different kind of voice to it. So I'll try and play one on this one here. Uh, this has got a finger rest on it, and I, I'm a lot of people ask me technique wise when I'm playing. A lot of times I lay my little finger down over here, and so. Sometimes I, I get caught up on the, like mine you'll notice doesn't have the, the finger rest on it, but um, I'll try and play on this one here. And when I'm laying my finger down, it's never, I'm never really pressing hard. Sometimes I'll see pictures and it looks like my finger's going backwards, you know, but I, it's, I don't even think about it. I just, I just lay it down there and it's sort of like an anchor. If I try, I've tried to, to close my hand and play, you know, and I've, I've tried it, tried it. And I think if I used one of these, if I kept a finger rest on one for a while, I would get more accustomed to it. But it's just, I, I've tried. I'm like, okay, this set, this show, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a conscious effort to keep my hand closed. And then I'll look down and it's just like that finger's down there just, you know. Uh, it's like a pivot point for me to, to know where the strings are. So, in relation to the pick and, and how I can control the pick. Let's see. takes me a minute, like on the beginning of that, it takes me a minute to figure out where I'm going to position this finger because I'm so used to, to setting it down, you know, but uh, there's, there's several schools of thought on that, you know, should you, should you use a closed hand, should you, you know, is it okay to anchor your little, little finger, is it, I've seen everything from, you know, laying it down to closed hand to, to you know, different people, uh, and with students of mine, I always, I always, there are certain things, certainly, that are, you know, you, I wouldn't recommend holding your pick up here, you know, like that or something. Or if someone has an obvious something that's gonna, gonna be a deterrent to their, their playing and, and being able to progress and play cleanly, um, something like that's an obvious one. But um, I don't find that if you're laying your little finger down, I wouldn't lay down more than one. You know, I've seen people that when they first start, they'll wanna lay like three of them down. And then that, that tends to immediately slow you down. And uh, an important thing to do right off the bat if you're just starting to play is to be able to get that down and up motion. Sort of start getting that ingrained in your head. Because it's important if you're playing flowing lines of single notes um, that a lot of folks back home when I first started playing, uh, 
it's sort of they would just sort of start the right hand going and set it down, you know, and then sort of wiggle around over here, sort of, you know, that kind of thing, just just going over here with the right hand. But and there's nothing wrong with that at all, certainly. But I I was always when I first started hearing the mandolin and getting interested in it, uh, I got real excited about it when I heard uh, folks like Dempsey Young and uh, Doyle Lawson and Sam Bush and David Grisman and folks that, that had their, it's all these different approaches to, to playing, you know, and certainly now I hear people, you know, I hear Chris Thiele play and it's like, that's not even a mandolin he's playing, you know, it's like it's every instrument in the world, it's whatever's on his mind at the time because he's, in my opinion, the best that's ever held one. And so when I hear people like that play and I watch their technique and how they approach it, it's just amazing, you know, to me. And I don't even call myself a mandolin player. I'm just, I'm learning like everybody. But I try to, you know, with, with students, I try to, you know, transmit uh, little tricks that I've learned over time about, you know, technique or, you know, ideas, how to approach, you know, building a solo or something like that. But uh, certainly uh, folks say, well, you know, you make every mandolin sound the same. Well, it's, it, there's the argument, you know, if, is, it the, is it the hammer or is it the carpenter, you know, is it how they, you know, what, yeah, I, I feel like I, over the years I've played for a long time and I, I sort of have a spot where I'm used to playing and I can, you know, it'll sound like me playing a little bit, but certainly an instrument makes all the difference. And, uh, you know, uh, you can, some of my students are, uh, they're young, young kids, you know, and they, they can't really just go, mom and dad, I want to get, I want to get this, you know, $150,000 mandolin that I saw, you know, at IBMA convention or something. But uh, there are so many good builders out there from Northfield to, so just stacks of them, you know, and um, and there's the, the the a better instrument. I know from learning on, you know, the first mandolin I had was a thirty dollar mandolin uh, from the flea market, and I was tickled to death to get it. My grandfather bought it for me, and um, my first mandolin lesson. I've told this all over the place. Was I went in to take a mandolin lesson and I didn't even know how to tune it, and um, it was with Audie Ratliff. Uh, who's a mandolin builder down in East Tennessee. He built my first F5 that I ever played. And I went in to take my first lesson and this mandolin was so cheap that the top was just really, really thin. I don't even know what it was made out of. Like paper mache or something, I think. But, um, I went in and he, he, he said, well, the first thing we've got to do is I've got to you know, get you familiar with how to tune it. You know, and he said, it's E, A, D, G. And so he had a, an A tuning fork and set it on the top, started tuning it up. And the more he tuned it up, the top went from this way to fold it up like that. And so he, he just kind of looked at it, and I was like, oh, my career's over. It's, I haven't even learned to tune it yet, you know, and it's over. And so my first mandolin lesson was him putting a sound post in that mandolin, like in a fiddle, you know, to, just, just to hold the top up, literally. And so I sold it to a guy for 50 bucks. He just wanted that mandolin for some reason, and I, I wish I'd kept it now, but I, I kept expecting to see in the newspaper locally that some guy was killed by a sound post <laughs> flying out the back of the mandolin. Because you could see the little spot right there in the back where it was about to come, you know, poking out the back of the instrument. But I, I, the instrument does make a big difference. It really does. And if you've got a reliable <laughs> instrument that, that plays, you know, and, and that's the thing about these mandolins and uh, the mandolins that I, that I have, that's the main thing I look for in one is one that's reliable, that you can, you can, it'll handle different situations. You can go from hot to cold or whatever. Of course, <coughs> it's an acoustic instrument, it's wood. It's gonna be temperamental to, to temperature and to humidity, as I mentioned earlier. But, um, you know, if the, when they note out true, the intonation's good, uh, it makes a lot of difference. Another question? I'll try. Now let me try, I'll, I'll show you the difference in these two here, like the way that the difference in, um, this one has a red spruce top, I believe. And um, it's a great man one. It's a little eight, the, these, are, these are brand new. They've started making these, these little A models. Uh, and these are made all here in Michigan. And uh, just terrific, terrific instruments. 
And uh, let's see. That's the, that's that one. Now this, thank you. Now this is the same make, the same everything ex, as far as I know, except this has an Engelman spruce top on it, and so it has a. It's almost a warmer, deeper. You can hear the difference in the in the tone of it, and I, I don't know. I I just go by the sound of it. I don't. I, leave it to these guys and, and great builders to I pick their brain about well, what makes that difference, you know. And, and I, was, I was speaking with Adrian about how, uh, I guess, Engelman has grown at a higher altitude and it's a lighter weight. And so it sounds broke in, uh, meaning that it, it sounds older. It sounds like it's been, you know, you're, when you cut, uh, I had a, a luthier tell me one time, you know, you're asking a tree to do something that it's not, accustomed to doing and, you know at all when you cut it up and and form it and make it and all that and so you know certainly there's a I feel like there's a breaking in time you know I feel like they, they get to a certain point and that's where they're going to be and certainly I, I man ones that are played a lot you know I feel like sound better I know my man ones at home if I'm playing one of my north fields and then I open up and play one of my other man ones you know uh, if they're not neglected, I try to play all of them a little bit, you know, but um, uh, if, if you don't play one for a while, they don't open up. And I've played some really old instruments, like old Gibsons. I was, I was fortunate enough to, here, I guess it was last year, uh, went to Elderly for the first time. And uh, they were kind enough to let me sit and play some of the really, really great vintage, you know, Gibson man ones from the 20s, you know, the Lloyd Lore sign man ones. And they had one in there that was just awesome. And... Uh, I could, it, it was weird because it, it, you could actually feel it. We sit and play for probably 45 minutes an hour or something like that, me and some of the other guys in the band. And uh, you could feel that mandolin opening up and you could feel it warming up and almost like, you know, just waking up and, and kind of getting its first cup of coffee and starting to really, really go. But there's that. And then let me hit this one real quick. You'll tell the difference. Um, This, that's what this one is right here, the, the big one that I play, it's, it's this type of spruce here. And um, uh, I, in, I have found in a, almost in a bluegrass context when you're playing with, you know, you've got, you've got fiddles and banjos and dobros and things like that. A lot of times that's better for that application because it, it, that something, I guess it's about that frequency range tonally that it will cause it to project better. And so, you know, uh, a mandolin's not as loud as a banjo, but it can be, <laughs> I guess, I, I don't know. That used to be my thing was, you know, I, I wanted to play loud, hard, and fast, just everything, you know, just smash mouth bluegrass was what I wanted, just to, to get in there and dig. But over the years, I've, you know, I've, I've tried to find something that's got volume, but has a real pretty tone to it as well. So, and that's certainly not to say that if it's just red spruce, I, I hate it because this is red spruce here, and that's a terrific mandolin. So um, you can try out different ones, but this this has a more of a, mandolin players call it a woody sound, a more of a, a deeper. Thank you. 
example of say the difference in in having that just the top you know the the red spruce as opposed to the engelman and i, I love them both for different applications you, they're they're both terrific you know um let's see now this is something that i don't have uh i don't have a i used to when i was allison kraus had a uh, there was a, a lady that um, had an, an old F4. This is actually along the lines of an F2, is mm -hmm. that right? And I'm, I'm not sure what the, the difference, but I had, the, I had access to that F4, which basically, for those of you that aren't real manlin uh, geeks like I am, like the F5 will have the, the, the F holes. The F5 will have the F holes is the way I you know, designate them sort of like the fiddle. And the uh, F4, or this, in this case an F2 styling, uh, has the round hole. And so you'll be able to tell the difference immediately with this one. This one has a... And this one, you don't see this a lot in bluegrass applications. You'll see this a lot in uh, Irish or uh, old time or things where it's more of a strummy, not so much the chop sort of bluegrass rhythmic thing that Bill Monroe popularized making that the blue the 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 mandolin in a bluegrass band setting is sort of like the the snare drum in a drum kit you know it's playing the offbeat the bass is hitting what the kick drum would do and the mandolin of course is doing the not that you can't use this in that setting but I think uh, I think Bill Monroe probably found that that using one like this had more of that pop you know rather than the low hollow sound like this but these are great. These are great to play. I mean, I'm, uh, I love sitting and fooling around with them. Let's see. Uh, I would use that F4 that, that Allison had, and it was a late teens, I want to say it was a 1917, 18 maybe. It was in great shape, terrific shape. And so I used it in, in some recording applications with Allison uh, on that song that she did, uh, When You Say Nothing At All, the, the Keith Whitley song. There's some mandolin backup on that, on one of the verses. And that's what I used on that, was that. And for that specific reason, because it had that sustain and you could you could slide and the note would you know really hang you know in the air so um, let's see. this one here this one is a this one's what they call F5S and it's you can see it's it's got the binding on the top it doesn't have the binding on the back or around the has the, the black binding around the peg head but this is more of a just a, a basic model but terrific man wins I have one of these actually at home that's got the Engelman top on it. And so when I, when I, when I sort of want that, like you, you heard the difference between these two, that's, that's the one I use sometimes in the, in the studio a lot. This one has the red spruce top, I believe. This one does.
That's a good one. That's a great axe, too. Do we, how many folks in here, uh, I know you were playing a while ago, and it was great. Uh, how many, just mandolin primarily is your primary instrument folks are here? So, so uh, any, any questions? Any questions about, yes, sir? Did you ever use a pickup on your mandolin? You know, I don't right now. Now, over the years, I've, in various uh, situations that I've played in, with um, the first time I ever uh, messed around with using one at all was when I was with Allison Krauss as part of her band Union Station. And Allison had started uh, doing some opening settings for, for different country groups. We opened several shows for Garth Brooks back in the 90s, you know, when he was you know, selling out places four and five nights in a row and things like that. And that was a big, that was a big thrill. You know, it was fun to do. But when you're playing acoustic instruments, it's, it's tough to, you know, like just setting up five mics, you know, and some vocal mics and kind of going at it. We were, we were having, having a tough time making it project. So we, we did use some pickups and uh, I, I messed with a couple of different applications. Uh, the first, first thing I did is I just, I had a Fishman bridge mount pickup. But I wasn't really, I, I wasn't really getting the, the tone that I wanted out of it. Anytime you, you plug one in, it seems like you lose, you work so hard on making it sound really full and acoustic, you know, and having that, that really warm, you know, acoustic sound. So what I did is uh, somebody recommended putting a, an, it, it was a, it was a, a little, called a mini flex mic, I believe that's what it was called. And it was mounted inside, it was, it was actually, where you plugged in was the, the end pin here. And so that was inside the mandolin. And then I also had the, the bridge mount, Fishman, and we ran it through a, I believe the company was Rain Acoustic Blender, I think is what they called it. And it, it looked like a little EQ thing that you could mess with. And so with that, I could, I could make it sound, you know, a little better. It had more warmth as well as you had plenty of top end that you could mess with and kind of adjust as you wanted. Soup to taste, I guess it was all subjective, but um, I'd mess with it. In different rooms, you had to do different things with it, you know. And the technology's gone so much beyond that now. You know, that was probably 93, 94, in that era, 95, maybe something like that, mid 90s, uh, that I was doing that. And there's so much stuff out there now. Fast forward to when I started playing with a group called Mountain Heart, and I played with them for nearly eight years. and they started wanting to do something where they could be more mobile on stage, you know, walk around and, and kind of play to each other as well as to the crowd and not be just stuck behind a microphone. So what we started messing with were these little, it was almost like a lavalier mic, like you'd see on a newscaster or something, you know, or like a, at a, you see at church, you know, like pastors using things. And um, what we'd do is we'd take them and it was just a little mini microphone, but that was awesome. It, it, you know, you could, I had a little, it was actually a, this was terrible probably for the mandolin, but I just took a, a coat hanger, you know, and the hook part of the coat hanger and clipped it off. The guy that was running sound for the band at the time sort of came up with this and we taped it up so it wouldn't just dig up the mandolin, but we just taped it down here. It wasn't pretty at all, but it was functional. And so it, it would mount right back here over the, the F hole in the back. So the mic was right there now. <coughs> that being said, the main problem with that is Dynamically, you can't. You you are at the mercy of who's running sound. You you have to. There has to be somebody that knows your show, knows when say you're going to kick a song off or you're going to do you're going to do a solo right at the end of this chorus. Because if not, it's you. When we're on stage, if you come watch our show tonight, you'll see we're going to be moving in and out of microphones because we don't use any kind of pickups at all on you know on our instruments. So. Um, we'll be walking in and out. If you were here earlier when we were doing the, the vocal thing, um, you have to be mindful of, in an acoustic band, dynamics and where things are at. Like, uh, you know, if you, some of the best jams and pickings that you'll ever get in are with folks that are sensitive to that, you know, and that you're, you're playing with folks that, if you're singing, you know, the dobro is not just raking, you know, with a, <laughs> with a, heavy fork, you know, 
you want to be sensitive to that. And, and the people that, the, the great players, you know, it's, it's just natural. You know, if someone's singing or if there's harmony going on, lighten up a little bit. If someone's taking a really, you know, and, and sometimes it's the lyrics of the song will dictate that. You know, if it's a mean murder ballad with banjo kickoff and everything, you know, you might play a little harder. But just always be mindful of that. And certainly, you know, when you're playing the mandolin, it's not the loudest instrument, you know, and so if, if you've got that microphone hooked up right there and you're totally at their mercy and, you know, it's, it can get frustrating sometimes, you know. But luckily we had a really good sound team that, that uh, we had a couple actually while I was traveling with them that they, they knew the show inside and out. But that's, that's paramount, you know, if, if, if you've got a sound man that can go with you and do it, it makes it a lot easier. But otherwise you're, you're just sort of standing there and if it's not up, it's not up. Yes, sir? What, what kind of uh, microphone do you use? What I usually, I'm, I haven't been one to carry my own microphone with me. I love uh, Neumann's, the KM184s or the old like KM84s, and, uh, the, the real small, like a real small condenser microphone. And love the tone of those. And when I'm recording, usually I'll use two of those. I'll I'll have I'll have one mounted sort of coming in down here where the the lower tone is, and then I'll sort of position one up here and run them stereo. And uh, so I, that's what I I like is is that kind of that kind of setting. But usually, like tonight, I'll just usually whatever they've got. I'm not you know. In, at most festivals and things, uh, this festival is not that way. But but a lot of festivals, it's like as soon as the lap, you know, the the band prior to you is scheduled until half past the hour, and you're scheduled to start at half past the hour. So that doesn't leave much time to you know get a lot of setup going. So you know, uh, and and some festivals like this one, you know, they they allow time. You can actually check and get everything dialed in, and so you're comfortable when you play. And that, that makes a big difference in your performance, you know, because if you're if you're like running around and you kick a song off and two or three of the microphones sporadically are on and off and all that, it takes a little while to get dialed in. So, yeah. But I, if I, if in a perfect world, I'd be able to take a one of those KM184s with me everywhere and hook it up and have plenty of time to dial it in, you know. But but it's not realistic sometimes. Yes, sir. You had that what did you call a lavalier? Yeah, it yeah. was. Do you it, think that's a It was amazing because now on top of using that, we were using the in-ear monitors, so we didn't have we. we it, it eliminated a lot of the feedback issues that you have because a lot of times when you're getting feedback and you're hearing squealing and things during a, a, a show, especially a lot of the time, not every time, but uh, probably the vast majority of the time, it's coming from the the monitor speakers that you see sitting on stage, and what happens is they're throwing sound this way. And if it gets into these microphones, then it starts, you know, just rolling around, and that's when you get all the, the ear piercing, brain rattling squeals and things, you know, that'll stunt your growth. But um, we were using the in ears and those little little small microphones. The, the microphones I, I neglected to tell earlier were built by DPA, was the the company out of Colorado. And I think they make everything from microphones that will clip on, like to bail. You see people with playing saxophone or trumpet, and they have little clips that go on the bell. Uh, I think they make those, and I think some of those I, I forget the exact model number of the one I was using. But, but being a, getting back to your question, we were able to get just as much volume as if you were certainly in front of a microphone, and that much more because. With the in-ear monitors, it cut down on the, the feedback potential, that makes sense. and the, and the microphone is right there. I mean, it's 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 in the mandolin's grill, if you will, and it just kind of you know you could you could crank it up loud, so it could you could get not rock and roll loud, but you know it's it can get pretty stout. Would it would it be possible to use like a volume control pedal or something? Yeah, yeah. There are people that play. Um, I know some fiddle players that actually do that, uh, that will have like a, but that sort of eliminates the being able to move around kind of thing, which I think is the function of it. But um, the, you know, there are people that do that, that will have the actual volume thing. But I would find that that would, that it may, it may cause issues 
with the sound man. You know, <laughs> if you're if you're wanting to go up, if you're pressing the pedal down to to the floor, and he's got it up, it could it could blow people's face off. Or it, you know, it might be the opposite. He might be turning it down when you're wanting to mash it. So uh, that could be the thing. But you know, if that was understood, and you certainly that's a whole other thing is 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 playing live sound, you know, if uh, in our situation with the boxcars, we don't carry our own sound man and we don't have a lot of equipment. We have in-ear monitors that we carry with us, but uh, we just use a line out off of the monitor board, not to get all technical, but um, we're able to, and this is getting totally off the mandolin subject, but we, I have an app on my phone that looks, it comes up and it looks like a little, Mackie makes this system, the Mackie Sound Company. And on, if you see us tonight, and I'm sitting up there, I'm not sending a text to my wife checking on my boys. It's a, it, it's a little, it's a, it, it, it's an app that you can download with this Mackie system, and it comes up and it looks like, and, and you can use an iPad as well, and so it comes up and it looks like a little mixing console, and you have little faders that you can slide. Each one of us has our own individual setup to where like. I'm probably going to want more mandolin and more of my vocal than anybody else will. So you can adjust, everything's labeled, you can, you can sit and adjust everything, and it, it works great. Technology, as I said, has changed so much since I started, you know, the, using uh, a pickup mic combo or a mini mic or whatever. It's changed so much over the years, and technology just keeps changing, and I'm sitting there looking at my phone doing my own individual mix. It's, it's pretty wild. It's, it's neat. You know, it's a great time to be playing. Uh, uh, I, I think about, you know, the folks years ago, the first generation bluegrass people that were out, you know, just playing around one mic and doing it and making it look so cool. And I watch those videos all the time. I get on YouTube and I just sit there for, for days watching the, the art form that was moving in and out of one mic, you know. And so I'm glad I don't have to do that these days. I'm a big man. I'd knock some people over. <laughs> Somebody else had a question? Yes, sir. The mandolins you're playing today, do mm -hmm. they have the same fretboard? Yeah, I think the only difference is, are any of these a flat board? I think every one of those is a radius modern yeah. board. I think what, um, the, the difference that you'll find in some mandolins, I think, the frets may all be the same size as well. I, believe they are. I prefer, uh, this is like back, if you, if you see some, you know, vintage mandolins, back then the standard fret wire for a mandolin was, was much smaller, meaning that the, the little frets that you see, the silver bars, um, the, the wire was smaller. This comes in these big rolls, you know, and it's just kind of that you take that much of it and hammer it down in here and, and smooth it off. But it was a lot smaller wire, and therefore it wore out quicker. And, and so they would, with the mandolin, like this mandolin, uh, Adrian was looking at it a while ago, I already, I, I play the, I've played it so much, you know, that uh, I'm wearing, you get these little, almost divots, little dents, indentions in your frets. And so that can cause intonation to be a little squirrely and all. And so uh, it's about time for a fret change in this one. The last time I sent it up, they can, they can file them down call it fret dressing and they can smooth them out but as far as the, the fingerboard goes this has and again you can't really see it from just looking at it head on that's why I've had to ask but um, this has just a gradual arch to the board meaning you know how fiddle fingerboards are almost like a some of them like see, look like a half moon you know compared to this this just has a gradual change to it in the radius and um, but some folks prefer the small frets, really small frets, the old school frets with a flat board, like just completely, you know, just it's it's flat here with the small wire, like that's the vintage kind of feel, traditional. And um, this is what the, the, the folks at Northville call a modern setup, which it seems to be what most folks like to play. But there are those that uh, they want that real small fret wire with the flat board, you know. And um, I've gotten used to playing with the uh, with a little bit of an arch. And you wouldn't think it would make that much difference, but when I pick up a, a mandolin, a lot of times, oftentimes it has a really flat board. You know, it, I have to change what I'm doing over here a little bit. And it's like I'm, I'm, I miss a couple of things until, until you go, okay, I'm, that's where it's at, you know. So, but that's the only difference. And some folks, uh, you know, may want even bigger frets 
I've seen people that put like guitar fret wire in their mantle. And I think a lot of that's for sliding, like having more accuracy. I, I feel like I have a lot more accuracy with my slides with a larger wire, the fret wire. So it's just, again, that's a subjective thing and I'm always tinkering. I like, I like flat boards, but prefer the, the radius. Yes, sir. Could you say something about technique? When you were first learning, was there any particular technique that enabled you to hit those clear, fast notes? There's, there's a couple of things that I do even, even to this day. Like I, yesterday, not to bore you with the, the, the travel info, but I was driving, we, we played in Eastern Ohio yesterday over in Fairview, Ohio, at a, at a little place over there. And that's not far from Wheeling, West Virginia, Southeastern Ohio, Central, Central Eastern Ohio. And so we got up above Cincinnati and it was just a white out, snow, crazy, had to go around <coughs> Columbus and get over there. So basically I walked in about, literally the, the opening group was about 10 minutes from being done. And I'd, been, I'd left at nine o'clock yesterday morning from home and took that specific route hoping to bypass the snow and drove right into it. So anyway, having said all that, I get there, I've got like 10 minutes to spare. So I walk in, change clothes, uh, hadn't, haven't touched a mantle and I've been sitting in the car. This was like eight o'clock nearly. So I've been in the car nearly 11 hours, you know. For about four hours of that, I was going about 10 miles an hour, you know, just poking along. So I'm sitting there, nerve shot, you're just, you know, you're whacked out. And so I'm like, how am I going to put a pick on a string, you know? And so a, a couple of things that I used to do just to try and get is, is go, I call it going in between the strings. And to me, I still do this. I try to do this. And do it on any, any pair of strings, E, A, A, D, D, G. Um, and just going, what you're doing is you're hitting a downstroke on, in this case, the A string, and then an upstroke on the D string. And I, I'll, I'll just sit and do that. You don't even have, you can mute it over here so you don't drive people crazy. And just to get that, and that again is getting, trying to get the feel, you know, of where I'm at and, and you know, am I in between and then. And that's another thing I'll do. I'll do the down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. So each, you're hitting the high, you're hitting the higher string. Up, down, down, up, up, down, down, up. And you're alternating, but it's still that down, up motion that I mentioned earlier. Because when that to me is, and, and that people, a lot of times we'll say, you know, well, I'm too old to play. I can't get my old, my old fingers just don't move. Well, these seem to always go. These will, I, I find with most of my students, like these will, these will be going okay. It's this over here. It's controlling a pick is, is a big thing. It's, it's, it's it, to me, it's overlooked by a lot of people when they're, they're just, they're learning and they're, 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 they're learning tunes and all that, but they get, they may get cramped up on a certain passage of a tune or a certain lick. And usually you can find what's causing things to go a little south is with the control of the pick. It's just having that. Uh, and having that, that ability to, to get in between the strings, I call it, for lack of a better thing. But to, to, and to build speed, people all, oftentimes will ask me, you know, well, how do you play fast? How do you get fast? And um, I, that was something that I was, my second mandolin lesson, I mentioned earlier the, 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 the good luck I had with the first one. Well, the second one, when we finally were getting down to the brass taxa stuff, he asked me what I wanted, you know, you got any tunes that, you know, you, what's something that you, you like? And I said, I want, I'd like to learn how to play rawhide, you know, Bill Monroe's rawhide. Well, I didn't even know how to tune a man on, you know, so he's like, well, we'll have to get to that. <laughs> so, you know, but speed was all I wanted to do was just play fast. You know, how, how can I play fast? And um, now I'd like to think I'm wiser as I've gotten older. And I'd, I'd, I'd rather just play something that's a comfortable speed, you know. There are, there's a lot of kids, uh, 
I'm on the faculty at East Tennessee State University, and there's a lot of kids over there that want to play really, really fast, you know, really fast. And um, so um, you try to gear them down a little bit and just, uh, you know, kind of calm it down. But um, trying to get building speed, that having the like that up and down motion over here and, and just messing with where you're at in relation to the bridge. You can affect a lot of stuff with your right hand. Your right hand is what's causing that, you know, the man on the speed. You know, you can sit here and wiggle your fingers around. You know, you can go all over over here, but over here is where you're, you're making it sound. And so people neglect the right hand and the technique of the right hand. And, you know, a lot of it is, it, it has to do with, with your particular makeup, how big are your hands, you know, what, uh, how, how much time can you afford to practice, you know, with family and business and stuff going on, you know. I started at a time when I was, I was 14 when I started playing, so I had all that, those high school years just, I got consumed with it and just played and played and played and played, and played, and played you know when I wasn't mowing yards to try and raise gas money to go pick somewhere, you know, I was, I was picking, so, you know, uh, but the, just getting that, so last night, when I when finally got out of the car, you know, and I was sitting there, and by then, I heard the opening band play the last lick, you know, they were, bong, 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 bang, okay, coming up in about 10 minutes, we got the boxcars, you know, and so I was, I was like, a, and trying to get that so and what that does for me is uh, uh, just it gives me that uh, it gives me this over here because these I can usually get these kind of whether you're playing a scale or some kind of a you know I've never been one that liked to play and I, I wish I had now but I've never been one that likes to play just, you know, exercises. Uh, that kind of thing. They're very, very helpful, but, you know, I would rather, I've always wanted to be, rather be playing a tune, you know, so usually I'm, I'm sitting and noodling around with tunes or I'll take a part of a tune and play it and, and maybe go into something else or try up and down and, and close positions and things like that. But, but usually just right hand stuff is, is what helps to get the, the individual notes. Because uh, you, 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 you can tell when specifically if you're, if you're buzzing a note, if you're not in between the frets like you want to be, or if you're not pressing hard enough, or if you've not got enough command with that, say, little finger or something, you'll know if you're pinching a note or something. But um, like to, to have the, To have the individual note is, is like over here. It's right hand thing. So uh, I would suggest just concentrating as much on right hand as as you do the left. And you don't even have to put the left hand on it to work on this. You know, I'll sit sometimes if I'm at home and just just going back and forth, you know, across the strings. And I'm not I'm not good at it, but that's just it helps me feel like I'm getting a little more synchronized between the left and right hand. Is the, the main thing. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things I admire is your fluidity. Well, thank I you. I know that you're working on. Yeah. Speaking of rhythm on your right hand, mm -hmm. what is your approach when you uh, play a melody? Mm -hmm. Because it seems like you're not on the rhythm. You're dancing around the rhythm yeah. to create uh, a lot more rhythm. Yeah. And what is your approach? Could you uh, explain that? Uh, during lead playing, you yeah. mean? Like when I'm playing lead? Yeah. yeah. Or back up also. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I seem to, I really, the folks that I admire are listening to and uh, the way that they approach things, um, like I, uh, something that really, I, I love to hear Stuart Duncan, the fiddle player, you know, it's not, certain mandolin players too, but, but I love players that do the unexpected as far as where they come in on something or, or they may uh, get halfway through a solo and just let one note kind of hang, you know, or s 
slide into something and uh, Jerry Douglas as well. Jerry Douglas as much as anybody. Um, he and Stewart, speaking of specifically of backup and how to back a vocalist, uh, they're the, they'll never be topped, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Like just the way that they approach getting in between the words and making one little thing happen, you know, and it, it's so effective. And so that's what I try to do on the mandolin. A lot of folks feel like, I think that you have to, the mandolin has to do the, you know, if there's any pause, if you're doing backup behind a vocalist, you know, but the mandolin has sustain, the mandolin can sustain. And so I've just always thought of, you know, uh, the, I don't mean this to be sacrilegious at all because I'm a Christian man, but the what would Jesus do? I've always, I, I sort of changed that to what would Jerry do? You know, I try to think what, what would he, how would he do this on the dobro? You know, and, I, or, and I, I think, you know, and slides and things like that that the mandolin can do, and it's, it's just as effective without, I feel like a lot of times with my tremolo anyway, that if I'm, those particular notes I'm just off the top of my head but if it were someone singing da, 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 you know just do a slide four notes right there one two three four you know and you're there and maybe start it on the uh, on an unexpected beat you know whereas like a phrase may end little no, I'm trying to think of a tune uh, but, I'm alone you my dear you know or, or whatever start it like sort of sneak in and it then it seems like you start a little after or a little before also so yeah. you stretch the yeah. beat a little or sure. you make it a little shorter to leave room for yeah. the next note yeah and that's that's just from I, I try not to do that when we're on stage I try to do that when I'm rehearsing because sometimes I've anytime I try to do that on stage I get some looks sometimes you know it'd be like <laughs> Yeah. And, and that's the, uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, when you're, when you're playing with people and playing dynamically, you don't want to get in the way, especially of vocals. No. I feel, I, I try to, it was a great, the, the, probably the, well, the, the most greatest experience, learning experience for me and just experience musically was playing with Allison Trous as part of Union Station because uh, just being around her and, and her voice, you know, it, it, as I said earlier, I was coming out of just playing pretty heavy-handed bluegrass all the time. And Allison loves heavy-handed bluegrass as much as anybody. She loves it. But, uh, you know, her, her voice, when she's singing what people know her for now, you know, is these, these beautiful melodies and songs and arrangements and things that she does. And so uh, I, had to, I had to really almost rein myself in and start thinking in terms of, okay, if I'm over here coming off the top ropes with heavy, you know, just thrashing on those songs, it's going to be like I'm waving a flag over here, you know. I'm, I'm playing the mandolin over here, don't listen to what she's doing, you know. So you've got to try and sit, fill in, you know, where it's supposed to be. So playing with her, uh, and some of those songs were awesome to, to change my mindset about backup in particular because you had all this space in between some of the lines and some of the things. And so you could monkey around with the, uh, okay, where's your entrance going to be? Are you going to come in right at the tail end of a word? Or are you going to let it, let it breathe for a couple of beats and then come in and start something? And then, you know, you go from there and think, okay, I'm going to come in right here. But I tried to do all that in my, in my time, you know, or maybe if we were in the studio and I had the luxury of, a, of an extra. But you don't know. also do that if you're playing some melody. Yeah. Inside of the phrase of the, the yeah. And, and I think Allison do it in her singing too. Sure. Rhythm a lot. Yeah, yeah. Rhythm is the that's the biggest thing is is timing. Timing and rhythm is something that I I was fortunate enough to grow up playing with some guys that were they were local to me, but Tim Stafford and Barry Bales. And you know, Barry Bales is, you know, the, the king of bluegrass bass, you know, in my opinion. Uh, he and the guy I play with now, Harold Nixon, are my two favorite people to play, you know, bass. And, um, but playing with 
Tim and then Tim Stafford. And Tim Stafford had this amazing, still does, plays with Blue Highway, the guitar player. He has this amazing technique, you know. And so I was 18 years old or something like that, playing in a group with these guys. And, uh, you know, that rhythm section was just, and timing was the big thing. That's just, you know, when I say timing, it's just when, the, when a song kicks off at a... <laughs> solid and uh, you know you you'll find that the best you won't know why but you'll look back on it and this is probably part of it is some of the best jam sessions that you ever get in are, are with people that are of like mind as you are rhythmically if your tendency is to kind of you know lay back when someone's singing and then it may speed up a little bit and then it may you know whatever uh, but you know you get in this mode where I'm always trying to think of keeping it absolutely as solid as you can without it being sterile without it feeling like you're not playing dynamically. You know, you want to be able to emphasize certain things, but uh, everybody gets jacked up, you know, and plays stuff. Like, most everything we do live is faster than what we recorded it. You know, it's just you get amped up, you know. I've got coffee sitting over here waiting on me right now, so they better look out. <laughs> but, but yeah, just, just dynamics, timing and dynamics are, are, because these are acoustic instruments and you don't have pedals you can step on and you don't have effects you can turn around and well, I want a little more grunge on this right here, you know, or, you know, you don't have pedal boards and things like that generally, you know. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but when you're just playing straight up naked on an acoustic instrument, you know, it's all up to your, how you're doing this, you know, or if you're left-handed over here. So you got to, it, it, it's all the world to it, you know. And timing is something that I work on constantly. I should have brought my little, I've got a metronome over here that, uh, goes with me. Try to, I try to play along with it a little bit every day.